Okay guys, um, so we're going to talk about OSH 5 and we're going to start with problem 1. I'll walk you through the solution. I'll also help you like walk you through as well through the Excel sheet and we'll figure everything out together. I have the solutions. What I'll do is I've written them down. I'll tell you point out the things and explain each and every part of my solutions. And we'll post both of this and the tutorial online. Okay, so let's begin. So in problem one, what they're asking us to do is, it's about an exponential data fitting. So when there's a natural phenomena, where you observe the data, and instead of being a best fit with a linear line, it somewhat resembles an exponential growth, like in this case where you have ozone depletion, right? When it replicates an exponential behavior, we use logarithms to help us model it as a linear function so that we can get a better idea of what's happening to the data itself. Okay, so the first problem is very simple. They're saying you have an exponential function given us like this here, where well, you have the function c e to the rt, and they say you gotta define a function gt that's just ln of that thing. So when you take ln of that function, because the properties of ln when you have two things being multiplied, what you can do is you can separate them and make it an addition like this. So once it becomes an addition, you can easily segregate this to be that way because ln e is just going to be equals to 1. So given the fact you can do that, um, this looks kind of like a straight line if you see very closely where t is the variable that you don't know what it is. r, here's just some number multiplied with the t which can replicate your slope m and in the other case you have ln c just as a constant out there. right? So this kind of resembles a straight line. In the second part, however, they just ask you the same problem. They ask you whether the graph that you'll make would resemble a straight line or not, or like maybe they just want to ask you which shape does it resemble to. But if you knew that the xy follows that curve, and then if you plot the ln of it, so the ln y here, will eventually give you something like this that we already saw it on top. This looks like a straight line, because you can call this one as b, and that part is the m. Okay, so given the fact the first two problems were pretty easy, now we need um, to submit a graph of this, right? So what we're going to do is from problem 1c, 1d, and 1e, I'm going to tell you how to make all of these graphs. But let me just take a second and uh, go a little bit forward and tell you more about how are we going to solve 1e. So when you have um, uh, want to find a line of best fit, the line of best fit will have this equation when you have t as your unknown variable. Given the fact that one, you're only looking for a and b, right? And as per the formulas given out in the class, that's the formula for a and that's the formula of b where all of this stuff is specified right here, okay? So I'm gonna walk you through. We're gonna take this note over there, forward up over there so we can take a look at it. But let's start uh, working on Excel now. I have my own sheet that I already worked on. It's already solved. But I'm going to walk you through how to make it. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to try to copy just this data. It's going to be easy for me to just work over. Let me just paste it there. Okay, so once we have all of this data here for us, we can start to like work on the things. So the first time what they want us to do is to actually make a graph of this. And Excel kind of helps you out very easily um, to kind of make it. So if you go to the insert option over there on the top, and you see there's a little option here about graphs, okay? So you can utter in like a line over there. And this is gonna probably not look like what you want it, but let's try to modify it. So if you right click on it, you can select data and what you want to do is you want to take away the year from here or like whatever name it's happening. So the only entry we're going to start on is the Y values that we have. And the horizontal category, we're going to choose that to be are these values. So you can clearly just go there, click and select whichever one you want. You press enter. Once you have this here, you press OK. This is how your graph is going to look like. So now you see it has um, all the years labeled on the axis, on the x-axis, and the amount on the y-axis, right? So you can just take away, you take a screenshot, or there's a better option, you can just right-click um, on the outer frame, 
and then you can save as a picture. And you can go there and you can save it, right? So that's how you'll make the first graph. Very straightforward, very easy. So now I'm gonna just like move it over there so we don't have to look at it all the time. And yeah, I have these nodes for one E. We'll refer to them later. Now, in the other part, they want you to do is take the natural logarithm of the data and then plot another graph with respect to that. So let's do that. So I'm gonna call that log of data, the, the heading of it. And all you gotta do is, in this formula, you're gonna say capital LN. So natural logarithm in Excel could be represented by capital LN. Once you put it in, and you gotta take a bracket, you choose this label here. So they'll compute the natural logarithm of it. And if you wanna copy that result down, the respective formula you just click on that little green arrow and you drag and drop all the way down there so all of these data is now the logarithmic data of whatever value is here okay cool so now we need a graph of this so we're going to do the same stuff we're going to go insert you see line charts select data you got to get rid of all of this only got to keep the log of data and then the horizontal axis label can be selected again from the same time that is the same years. Oops, it's 53, so maybe 54. Now let me type that, 54. And that should be good. Once you have it, you press OK. Now you see the log of data looks a little bit different than what you were kind of like getting in the other one because you have reduced values and more smoothened curve. So in these portions out here, you see it's kind of like a linear line and same trend is observed here. So the further question we're gonna talk about things, we can talk about things in those zones, okay? So again, you can save this as your screenshot or yeah, you can just like work on it. But yeah, now we'll just like, I'll move it out of the way because we don't need to focus too much on it. Now for part E, what they're asking us to do is to represent um, the data from 1961 up to 1975. So all the data that I've colored in the blue, I just kind of color coded it so it's easier for us to see what's happening and which data we're trying to be talking about, right? So we did that. Um, and then they want you to find the line of best fit. So now I'm gonna move this up a little bit here so we can clearly see what's happening. I'm gonna get rid of this graph so I don't need them. So I'm just gonna delete this graph and delete that graph, okay? So to calculate the line of best fit, in this case, when you have data as Y, hold on, what happened here? Where did that go? Let me fix that for a second. back on track so when you're looking for line of the best fit the data is y which is going to be actually the log of data so this is going to be our y data points all of them here are the t data points we don't have them here because we have years in like actual numbers but for the sake of the problem they want us to actually start at t equals to zero where it represents 1961 and then go all the way up to t equals to 16 where it represents 1975 okay so we're gonna make a column for that. We don't have the data T values. And now all of this stuff from it, so the power average, the, the product average, uh, I have, there's a typo here. I'll write it down. So there, it should be T times Y and the average of that. Okay, so all the quantities that you have T, multiply with the respective Y's, take an average of that. Well, T average is just taking up all of the sum of all the T values, divided by the N, same thing with the Y. And t squared average is just taking the squares of the t values and then taking their average. Once we have all these quantities here, what we can do is we can compute the a value. Once we have the a value, we can compute the b value. Okay? So I'm going to start to like tell you how to do it. So let's make a column for the t values first. In this case, we have t's. It's going to start at 0, and 1. And then if you want to copy it down, you can select both of them. And Excel will drag it down to this number by itself. So these are the T values they're gonna look at. At all of these T values, the respective Y values are this, okay? So we'll start to compute like little pieces of this. So let's compute T average, right? Which is just gonna be the average of all of these values. And you can use the built-in Excel function for this, okay? So T average is just gonna be 
given out to us by that. You just put equals to and you type, start typing A. So you see average here, you click on that. And then I'll ask you for a range. So you select these data, the data that you want to take the average of, and you press enter. So that's going to give us the T average right away. Okay, so figured out this, this T bar or T average. Now let's figure out the Y bar or the Y average. Y average could be just again same computation. Just you type average, this and the this 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 time the y values are here. So you're gonna use them here, and that's gonna be the average of the y values. Now what else do we need? We need the average of the power or the product. Sorry, right? So let's make that column first, so it'll be easy for us to take the average later on. So if you take that. P average is literally just, uh, let's figure out the P first, not the average. P are just gonna be products of the respective columns right here. So I can write a formula where I say equals to, it's gonna be whatever the entry here, times whatever is the corresponding Y value at that point. And then you can drag and drop down all the way to compute all the products. Okay, at the same time, we've gotta still compute um, this one here. So we'll compute the T squared values so then it's easy for us to actually compute the average of it, right? So we'll have a T squared, and that's literally the entry is gonna be equal to the T value times the T value. Okay, you can just click on them and they'll pop up. And you can copy the expression down so you now you have a column representing the T squares. Now, we gotta figure out the average of this column and figure out the average of that column. Okay, so let's do that. Once you figure out the average, we're gonna call that P AVG. Again, you gotta use the same formula, average of all of these values. We got that one here, cool. So now the other one is gonna calculate this AVG. So T squared average is just gonna be given by the same formula again, but now the average is gonna be from these guys. Okay, so now we have all the pieces we need. We have the T bar, we have the average of the Y or Y bar, we have the, the product average, and then we have the T squared average. Now, to compute the value of A, we gotta follow this expression that we have here. So in this case, I'm gonna put equals to, you bracket open, the first thing you gotta type up is this P average so it's right here so I'm gonna use that value you take away T average times Y average so take away bracket open the T average is here times so you gotta put a star there Oops, see star there the Y average shut it off so that's that's one thing and that's gonna be the numerator of the problem divided by the denominator is gonna take the T squared average which we have in this column so we're gonna just like Compute that right away. This is a T squared average. And now you gotta take away the T bar squared. So basically the T average squared. So this is a T average, and now you gotta take away the square of it. So you just kind of put that in with the square. Once that's done, you can click on it, and BAM will just give you the right value for the A. So it's easy for us to compute that using this and then explain it in words like what we did on the Excel sheet, right? Um, and then the B value could be computed by just the Y average minus A times the T average. So I just put an equals to, the Y average here is given by that minus the A value. So I'm gonna put them in the bracket first because I gotta multiply. The A value here is just what we just calculated this times the T average and T average is right here. Punch it in, and that's what you get. So in this case, the, the best line will be y equals to this a value that you had, and then minus b. a times t minus b, my bad. So this is what we're looking for. These are the actual MVP spots. Right, we're gonna do the same stuff here for, I think, um, the period from 1988. Uh, up till 2013. So I have them labeled in an orange color so it's like easy for us to code it. Now we gotta follow the same exact procedure uh, for all these values. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this again. So I'm going to call that column T. I'm going to actually just copy all these. I'm going to paste them here. So I have a, have a reference of what we're trying to do. Um, the T values again, now you want 1988 to be a zero value. So you're going to start labeling them 0, 1, um, 2, and so on from this point onwards. And when you keep on going down, this is what you're going to get. Same thing as now, you got to like to find the average, same stuff. Average of all of these values. And that comes out to be 12.5. And then you talk about y average. So average of all the y values. And these are going to be our y values. The, P, the product values, you have to still calculate them. So I have to like say it's just going to be the product of this thing times the corresponding t value of that. So once you do that, you can copy the expression down, you get all of that. Same thing with t score. The expression here is just going to be um, this guy times itself. And then you copy down the formula, you get the same average. And now the p average could be computed by the same formula. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to like type it in here for the first time so it's easy for us to kind of like see these are all the power values I'm going to take all the average of these guys press enter you get that t squared average so again the average formula of all of these values so that's what we got here now to compute the a value I'm going to just try to copy the formula from the top just to make it quicker because it's just just changing a little bit of stuff so I'm going to copy it Oopsie, hold on. I gotta kinda like make sure what happens here. So now I'm gonna paste it. Once you paste it, you'll see the same number, so don't panic. What we gotta do is we gotta uh, change the formula. So this was referring to the, the second column. Now we want this to refer to the 29th. So what I'm gonna do is I'll replace all the twos with 29s. So you start up here, that becomes I have 29. E of 29. F of 29, I missed that. With that. And this. So see all these colors pop up. So now it's calculating the A value given all of these data values. Press enter, and you boom, you have the result. The other case, you can still copy and paste the formula, so I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm just going to like, but it's too easy to type. I'll just probably type it in. This is just going to be your y average this value minus your a value that we got times the t average that we have so now in this case the other a and b values are these guys so now we figured out both the fits this one e and one f together what happens is um, when they ask you to write the exact equation of a line all you gotta do is replace these a's and b's with the values you got here. Now in this case, if you observe, A is the slope of the line, right? And then you see here the A is positive, which kind of represents you have an increasing slope, which we saw in the graphical trend, where the data actually increases, right? Um, we were expecting it to have a positive slope. However, in the other case, you have a negative slope with a negative A, which means it's declining. And you can see in this graph, it is having a declining trend. So that's how you make the Excel sheets. Now, whatever's left here, uh, we're just going to like tana, convert these linear logarithmic data fits into actual exponential functions. Okay, so let's talk about that in a second. Okay, so we're back at um, the actual work now. So once we're done with the Excel sheets, um, this data kind of just explains you what I did over there. So uh, as we talked about in the Excel, so this is kind of like just giving it out of there, putting the words together. So whatever was my A value here became my A value here. Whatever I got in the B became my B here. So this is the equation of a line. It has a very minute slope, which is okay. We'll see the trend later on. And if you see at the bottom, um, we did the same thing, same approach for 1F, uh, and just found out this value just becomes your A, that value just becomes your B value right here. Okay, 
So we got 1 and f, um, both of them down here. Now we got to find the exponential functions from these, right? So let's kind of like go there. Now that we know the exponential function was looked like this, right? And then if you want to find the ln of those y values, they have an rt plus ln c. So now you got to compare the equation that you got to the ln of actual y's and then figure out what the y value is going to be. So from 1961 to 1975, you know your ln y, technically because you're plotting the ln data, so we're going to call that ln y, is whatever you found out for your a, t plus b, where a kind of represents whatever the r was here, and then ln c is just whatever the constant was there. So they're kind of like, if you compare those two equations, you can kind of see whatever's r here became this thing here, whatever's ln c became that thing here. So comparing those two, where you can you can kind of like decipher the information for what, what is r going to be, and what is c going to be? Because of ln c, if that is, ln, is that number, you can clearly find c by just taking the exponential. So now when you compose the final function, what you'll get here is this. So given that c is just that number, so c here will just become that number here, times e to the power of this right here is your r value because that's your r value over there and then t. So what I'm trying to do here is just to compile, compose the same function by now knowing the c and the r value. Okay, so that's the first function and we got to do the same procedure for the other ones um, and figure out the other function is just going to be a negative exponential. And this makes sense. The negative exponential will mean that the thing is decaying and we can figure out the value uh, for the future from these predictions. And that's exactly where we're going to come up um, to part h. Also a disclaimer that you can always solve these values to put exact actual numbers. But again, it's the same point. It's just not necessary because if you can show them the valid work that you did, um, it should be okay. But yeah, if you feel kind of like skeptical about it, please make sure you solve it. I'm just lazy, <laughs> so I'm not going to do it. Okay, so now we're going to uh, actually figure out the difference between our prediction and the actual real values, right? So what it told us that in 2014, the real value was somewhere around 15500, or zero, right? So now we want to find out how our model predicts it. The function that's going to work for our prediction is this one because that's the one for the for the right amount of period, right? So if you're looking at that one, we've got to work on this. So if you plug in t equals to 26, the reason why you plug in 26 is because that function is given with the reference of t equals to 0 when it's 1988, right? So from 1988 up to 2014, it's going to be 26 years. Is it okay or no? Maybe I'm, I'm tripping. Shouldn't be 26. Okay, hold on. Let me check what's happening. Mm, I think so. Yeah, 26 years. Yeah, okay. I was tripping. My bad. Sorry about that. So now we got 26 years. And then the predicted value will just mean you plug in 26 into this function here. So once you plug it in, this is the value you'll get when you solve it. Roughly approximates to be 142 triple zero and now you got to compare this percentage with what this is and you got to say so as you see the predicted value is this and the actual values are higher so if you actually do the ratio of them and figure out the percentage you'll see it's 9.15 percent higher than the predicted value and that's how you do problem one for the ash all right so let's talk about problem two now Problem two is about uh, related rates, and uh, we're going to talk about like a like a balloon that they use in surgery. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that. I'm just trying to like make sure I'm on the right page with you guys. Okay, so now um, we have this uh, weird shape, kind of like a angioplasty balloon, which um, has a fixed length here. So the length is fixed, and this R just kind of inflates when you push air into it, right? So this fills up, and that's what kind of looks like. Description is we have two cylinders capped up with these cones. Okay, so um, we're trying to like go baby steps and see what they're asking us. First term, they're asking us an equation for the volume of the balloon in terms of L, R, and H. So in this case, um, volume is pretty straightforward. It's going to be composed of the volume of the cylinder. That's this portion right here. And then you got to add up the volume of the two cones that are on the side. Like those, right? So those two cones, you can add them up, 
you get that the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared l given this l on the radius r. The other case is 1 over 3 pi r squared h. That's the volume of a cone. And then you have two of them, so you got to do that. When you add them up, you get 2 over 3 pi r squared h. So now from this point onwards, we know the volume of this um, volume of this uh, kind of like balloon. We'll keep on just keep it easy. I'm gonna call it balloon. Now um, the second part is asking us that uh, in order to avoid rupturing the artery, the surgeons must be careful that the diameter of the artery never expands faster than k percent per minute, where k is a positive constant. So in other words, they said the dd dt, where capital D represents the diameter must never exceed this. So this is the statement that they've given us, okay? Now given this information, they want you to figure out exactly what's happening with the radius. So using the answer from there, they want you to find the bound on dr dt. So if the diameter could only ex like expand at much, this much rate at max, how fast can the radius expand? So now the thing here is kind of like an intuitive reason that if the diameter is increasing, the radius is also kind of like increasing um, at the same time. So it's a linear relationship because you know diameter is just twice the radius of r. So even if you plug it in and you try to take a derivative of this expression with respect to time, you're going to get d d d t equals to twice of dr dt, right? Given that information, you can plug this d d d t back into that equation. And then what you're gonna get is um, 2r dr dt less than that quantity, right? And then given that d is just 2r, so you can you can plug that in here as well, and you want to resolve for this, you, the the two goes away, and you're gonna get the same expression. Well, the kind of is like the maximum cap on the radius is just whatever the maximum cap on the the diameter is, right? It's just gonna be proportionally small because the shear shear of linear relationship. Okay, so dr dt must never exceed that thing. And then given the quantity was given to you, the dd was given, I forgot to kind of write it here, so I'm gonna do it right now. So this quantity here was given with the units of millimeter um, per minute. So it's like the rate is de uh, increasing or decreasing at that many minutes, right? So I'm gonna like um, keep that in hand. So same thing here, when you're trying to talk about dr, it's just a measurement of length, that's in millimeters, and it's gonna decrease at the same rate that we talked about before. Okay, so now, um, let's jump to the next one. So the 2c part, now they want you to find that in terms of the volume. It's nothing major, but just most of the times, it's just gonna be a very basic, let me just turn off these things, yeah. So, very basic um, kind of approach in like algebra. Let's try to do it. So when you take the derivative, when you have this velo um, volume, you can factor it out in this form. And all, the reason why I do that is kind of make it very easy to kind of identify all of that as a constant. So it's gonna be easy for us to take a derivative later on. So now when you take a derivative of this expression, you get dv dt pi times derivative of r squared is two r dr dt and then L plus 2H over 3 just stays as a constant. Multiply it to it, right? So now that you know from the previous part that dr dt can only be maximum by that, so you can keep a maximum cap on dv dt where your dr dt could be the maximum possible value. So once you know that, you plug it in into this form and then you kind of like isolate for stuff. So R, R becomes R squared. This k comes out with the pi, so you have this, and then two's there, a hundred's there, so everything's just hanging around this place. In this problem, this is where you'll submit your answer as the final way, because they want it to be in terms of k, r, l, and h. And then the units for this one will be millimeter cube per minute, because every dimension here is supposedly uh, supposed to be in millimeters, um, and the radius is also in millimeters. The rate will depend upon how much millimeter cube you're adding per minute, right? So that's that's what these units are gonna be chosen. Now for 2D part, they want you to convert this expression in terms of volume. So that's the reason why I factored that out first to kind of make sure that you see it in this way where um, you can clearly call this whole piece as the volume because that's the same expression right there. 
Now, given that thought, what you can do is you can just literally write them as like this. And then when you simplify it a bit, you get that to be this much. And the same unit is going to be there, millimeter cube per minute. So now if you see that, the maximum uh, rate at which the volume can change depends upon the volume itself. Okay, And the volume is increasing when you're inflating the stuff. So it's getting air into it. The bigger it gets, okay, the more the volume will get, the bigger this bound is going to be, which means the faster you can fill it. Okay. So now again, the other problem is just asking what we just talked about. They're saying in the beginning, we know the volume is pretty small, so the max value, this is pretty slow. Now, you can only fill it up up to the max possible value, right? So it's going to be the slowest when you're in the beginning because dvdt is also going to be like closer to zero. We shouldn't add error fast, right? Because it's going to cause a rupture, right? So the upper bound is going to have a small value. Now, as V grows, the upper bound becomes bigger, and as you can add air faster to the balloon. So just to put it in a simple words, what they're asking us, we should add more slowly in the beginning. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about 2F. Uh, in this case, now they give us numbers to actually figure out the bound on it. Pretty much the same algebra. So all you got to do is you have the 3 millimeter for the radius at t equals to 0. That means in the beginning. You have 5 centimeter length and you have 1 centimeter height where the k is 5. Given all the information when you're trying to figure out the actual bound, you know that from the previous part that you solved and the volume here is here right here in front of you as an expression. Um, given both of them, what you can do is you can compute all these uh, volume and plugging in all these quantities, but you got to make sure you convert everything into the right units. Okay, right now we have radius in millimeters. The length was in centimeters and halogies in centimeters, so we want to make sure you convert everything in either millimeters or centimeters before you start to solve the problem. I choose to convert it in millimeters, so what I did is just like convert five centimeters into millimeters, that's 50 millimeters, and then one centimeter is just 10, okay? So from this, when you compute the volume, that comes out to be this number. And once you have the volume, you know the max dvdt is when it's going to be just equals to what the quantity here is going to be. So you know the K value, you know the V value now, you plug it in and you solve for it, you get this to be 51 pi millimeter cube per minute. Okay, that's the maximum rate where you can just add the volume at. Now from this, they wanted to find out what's going to be the maximum rate um, uh, happening in the other part. Let me just check. I think they're asking us how long it'll take um, for the artery to grow, for the balloon to grow from a uh, diameter of... Um, three millimeters to three centimeters. So in this case, we kind of like uh, have to interpret the results from what we have in the data. So we know the DVDT from 2C that we figured out. And now we can isolate it for DRDT given the DVDT, right? So once you do it, you move everything, you divide the whole equation by this blob here, and you're gonna get the same thing. So now when your R is three millimeters to begin with, and your H is 50, all oh, that's the same numbers, you compute all of this, your DRDT will have a value of this. Like you're just plugging in all the numbers for DVDT, R values, L, H, and all those things. So plug it in, you solve it, you get this. So now if you know the DRDT, that means the rate of change of the radius at per unit time is just this number here, you want the change to go from three millimeters to 30 Oh, sorry, actually 3 centimeters, which is 30 millimeters. So the change you're trying to get is 27. Now you know the rate is this much per minute, so you can just say the dt is just dr times the other word, and you get easily isolate for the dt, which tells you how long it's going to take before you're going to reach from 3 millimeters up to 30 millimeters at this rate. Okay, it's just that kind of unitary thing to do in the head. But yeah, you can always follow along the work that I did. And I'm getting about 164.17, 117 minutes. Okay, this kind of makes sense because the length is pretty long, and then given the long length, it will take some time for it to grow. Okay. All right. So now the last problem, they're asking us to actually figure out um, a new machine with different dimensions for L and different H. Um, they have given us the rate that it pumps air into it, and they've given us the K value. They want to figure out like what kind of arteries it is safe for. So from my interpretation, they want us to kind of answer the question in a way um, 
about for which arteries it's going to be good if it stays in that radius okay so for bigger arteries and smaller arteries or like what kind of bound are you looking at for this um of course my interpretation is like kind of um weird but i'm pretty sure everybody agrees with me that that's the way they kind of want the answer with but yeah i'm pretty like open with the discussion on this I give my interpretation of it. If you think there's some other ways to do it, um, please let me know, but we'll talk about it more, right? So let's compute that. Now the length is in centimeters, but the height is in millimeters, okay? So watch out for that. The dv dt is in centimeters cubed. So now just to make sure that everything is coherent, I'm gonna convert everything in centimeters, okay? So we're gonna have a better way to do it. So now we know the bound from 2f is just gonna be dv dt, it's just that thing. Now you know in this case the radius is something that we don't know yet. We know the k value, we know the l value. The h value for five millimeters is just half a centimeter. And a half times two, we'll just get rid of that, so you'll get one, right? So I'm gonna plug in all the values, dvdt is that. Uh, the k value just became five. We don't know the r value, we plug in the l value, plug in all those. So we have this bound. You keep on solving the algebra, uh, what you're gonna get is this is supposedly supposed to be the bound on it. So if you keep on approximating the results, even though you don't have to necessarily do it, but it's kind of like helps us to frame our argument better. At the end, we're just gonna say, so we got this condition, as long as your R is greater than or equals to 4.23, this is gonna work just fine, okay? So the minimum or the smallest artery this machine is gonna ever work for is gonna be somewhere about 4.23, centimeter radius okay so you got to always like kind of interpret the answer and say it this machine will be safe for arteries which have radius smaller than or equals to 4.23 centimeter anything bigger than that is okay because then it cannot cause a rupture but then that's the minimum bound you got to start at because you're pumping at 15 centimeters per minute that's kind of a fast rate as compared to what we got on the last one so you're expecting to start at like a bigger radius than a very really small one right so in the previous case, we were having three millimeters. Now we're having like 4.23 centimeters. So it's like kind of about like 420, uh, actually 42.3 millimeters. So we're having like about 10 times enlargement because we have a very fast speed as well, okay? So I hope this makes sense. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. I'm down to talk about it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compose all of these with a Google um, Drive and I'll have this PDF and a Google Drive with the Excel sheet posted with the link in the description. So please follow along, and I hope you like it. Thank you so much.